The Collected Works of Edgar Allan Poe, Raven Edition, Volume 2, Landor's Cottage. A Pendant to the Domain of Arnheim During a pedestrian trip last summer through one or two of the river counties of New York, I found myself, as the day declined, somewhat embarrassed about the road I was pursuing. The land undulated very remarkably, and my path, for the last hour, had wound about and about so confusedly in its effort to keep in the valleys, that I no longer knew in what direction lay the sweet village of B, where I had determined to stop for the night. The sun had scarcely shone, strictly speaking, during the day, which nevertheless had been unpleasantly warm. A smoky mist, resembling that of the Indian summer, enveloped all things, and, of course, added to my uncertainty. Not that I cared much about the matter. If I did not hit upon the village before sunset, or even before dark, it was more than possible that a little Dutch farmhouse, or something of that kind, would soon make its appearance. Although, in fact, the neighbourhood, perhaps on account of being more picturesque than fertile, was very sparsely inhabited. At all events, with my knapsack for a pillow and my hound as a sentry, a bivouac in the open air was just the thing which would have amused me. I sauntered on, therefore, quite at ease, Ponto taking charge of my gun, until at length, just as I had begun to consider whether the numerous little glades that led hither and thither were intended to be paths at all, I was conducted by one of them into an unquestionable carriage track. There could be no mistaking it. The traces of light wheels were evident and although the tall shrubberies and overgrown undergrowth met overhead, there was no obstruction whatever below, even to the passage of a Virginia mountain wagon, the most aspiring vehicle, I take it, of its kind. The road, however, except in being open through the wood, if wood be not too weighty a name for such an assemblage of light trees, and except in the particulars of evident wheel-tracks, bore no resemblance to any road I had before seen. The tracks of which I speak were but faintly perceptible, having been impressed upon the firm yet pleasantly moist surface of what looked more like green Genoa's velvet than anything else. It was grass, clearly, but grass such as we seldom see out of England, so short, so thick, so even, so vivid in colour. Not a single impediment lay in the wheel-route, not even a chip or dead twig. The stones that once obstructed the way had been carefully placed, not thrown along the sides of the lane, so as to define its boundaries at the bottom with a kind of half-precise, half-negligent and wholly picturesque definition. Clumps of wild flowers grew everywhere, luxuriantly in the interspaces. What to make of all this, of course, I knew not. Here was art, undoubtedly. That did not surprise me. All roads, in the ordinary sense, are works of art. Nor can I say that there was much to wonder at in the mere excess of art manifested. All that seemed to have been done might have been done here, with such natural capabilities as they have it in the books on landscape gardening, with very little labour and expense. No, it was not the amount, but the character of the art which caused me to take a seat on one of the blossomy stones, and gaze up and down this fairy-like avenue for half an hour or more in bewildered admiration. One thing became more and more evident the longer I gazed. An artist, and one with a most scrupulous eye for form, had superintended all these arrangements. The greatest care had been taken to preserve a due medium between the neat and graceful on the one hand and the picturesque, in the true sense of the Italian term, on the other. There were few straight and no long uninterrupted lines. The same effect of curvature or of colour appeared twice, usually, but not oftener, at any one point of view. Everywhere was variety and uniformity. It was a piece of composition in which the most fastidiously critical taste could scarcely have suggested an immediation. I had turned to the right as I entered this road, and now, arising, I continued in the same direction. The path was so serpentine that at no moment could I trace its course for more than two or three paces in advance. Its character did not undergo any material change. 
Presently the murmur of water fell gently upon my ear, and in a few moments afterward, as I turned with the road somewhat more abruptly than hitherto, I became aware that a building of some kind lay at the foot of a gentle declivity just before me. I could see nothing distinctly on account of the mist which occupied all the little valley below. A gentle breeze, however, now arose, as the sun was about descending, and, while I remained standing on the brow of the slope, the fog gradually became dissipated into wreaths, and so floated over the scene. As it came fully into view, thus gradually, as I describe it, piece by piece, here a tree, there a glimpse of water, and here again the summit of a chimney, I could scarcely help fancying that the whole was one of the ingenious illusions sometimes exhibited under the name of vanishing pictures. By the time, however, that the fog had thoroughly disappeared, the sun had made its way down behind the gentle hills, and thence, as it with a slight chasse to the south, had come again fully into sight, glaring with a purplish lustre through a chasm that entered the valley from the west. Suddenly, therefore, and as if by the hand of magic, this whole valley and everything in it became brilliantly visible. The first coup d'oeil, as the sun slid into the position described, impressed me very much as I have been impressed when a boy by the concluding scene of some well-arranged theatrical spectacle or melodrama. Not even the monstrosity of colour was wanting, for the sunlight came out through the chasm, tinted all orange and purple, while the vivid green of the grass in the valley was reflected, more or less, upon all objects from the curtain of vapour that still hung overhead, as if loath to take its departure from a scene so enchantingly beautiful. The little veil, into which I thus peered down from under the fog canopy, could not have been more than four hundred yards long, while in breadth it varied from fifty to one hundred and fifty, or perhaps two hundred. It was most narrow at its northern extremity, opening out as it tended southerly, but with no very precise regularity. The widest portion was within eighty yards of the southern extreme. The slopes, which encompassed the vale, could not fairly be called hills, unless at their northern face. Here, a precipitous ledge of granite arose to the height of some ninety feet, and, as I have mentioned, the valley at this point was not more than fifty feet wide. But, as the visitor proceeded southerly from the cliff, he found on his right hand, and on his left, declivities at once less high, less precipitous, and less rocky. All, in a word, sloped and softened to the south, and yet the whole vale was engirdled by eminences more or less high except at two points. One of these I have already spoken of. It lay considerably to the north of west, and was where the setting sun made its way, as I have before described, into the amphitheatre, through a cleanly cut natural cleft in the granite embankment. This fissure might have been ten yards wide at its widest point, so far as the eye could trace it. It seemed to lead up, up like a natural causeway into the recesses of unexplored mountains and forests. The other opening was directly at the southern end of the vale. Here, generally, the slopes were nothing more than gentle inclinations, extending from east to west about one hundred and fifty yards. In the middle of this extent was a depression, level with the ordinary floor of the valley. As regards vegetation, as well as in respect to everything else, the scene softened and sloped to the south. To the north, on the craggy precipice, a few paces from the verge, up sprang the magnificent trunks of numerous hickories, black walnuts and chestnuts, interspersed with occasional oak, and the strong lateral branches thrown out by the walnuts especially, spread far over the edge of the cliff. Proceeding suddenly, the explorer saw, at first, the same class of trees, but less and less lofty, and salvatorish in character. Then he saw the gentler elm, succeeded by the sassafras and locust, these again by the softer linden, redbud, catalpa, and maple, these yet again by still more graceful and more modest varieties. 
the whole face of the southern declivity was covered with wild shrubbery alone an occasional silver willow or white poplar excepted in the bottom of the valley itself for it must be borne in mind that the vegetation hitherto mentioned grew only on the cliffs or hillsides were to be seen three insulated trees one was an elm of fine size and exquisite form it stood guard over the southern gate of the vale another was a hickory much larger than the elm and altogether a much finer tree although both were exceedingly beautiful it seemed to have taken charge of the northwestern entrance springing from a group of rocks in the very jaws of the ravine and throwing its graceful body at an angle of nearly forty-five degrees far out into the sunshine of the amphitheatre about thirty yards east of this tree stood however in the pride of the valley and beyond all question the most magnificent tree i have ever seen unless perhaps among the cypresses of the itchiatuckany it was a triple stemmed tulip tree the lyrodendron tulipiferum one of the natural order of magnolias its three trunks separated from the parent at about three feet from the soil and diverging very slightly and gradually were not more than four feet apart at the point where the largest stem shot out into foliage this was at an elevation of about eighty feet the whole height of the principal division was one hundred and twenty feet nothing can surpass in beauty the form or the glossy vivid green of the leaves of the tulip tree in the present instance they were fully eight inches wide but their glory was altogether eclipsed by the gorgeous splendour of the profuse blossoms conceive closely congregated a million the largest and most resplendent tulips only thus can the reader get any idea of the picture i would convey and then the stately grace of the clean delicately granulated columnar stems the largest four feet in diameter at twenty from the ground the innumerable blossoms mingling with those of other trees scarcely less beautiful although infinitely less majestic filled the valley with more than arabian perfumes the general floor of the amphitheatre was grass of the same character as that i had found in the road if anything more deliciously soft thick velvety and miraculously green it was hard to conceive how all this beauty had been attained i have spoken of two openings into the vale from the one to the north-west issued a rivulet which came gently murmuring and slightly foaming down the ravine until it dashed against a group of rocks out of which sprang the insulated hickory here after encircling the tree it passed on a little to the north of east leaving the tulip tree some twenty feet to the south and making no decided alteration in its course until it came near the midway between the eastern and western boundaries of the valley at this point after a series of sweeps it turned off at right angles and pursued a generally southern direction meandering as it went until it became lost in a small lake of irregular figure although roughly oval that lay gleaming near the lower extremity of the vale this lakelet was perhaps a hundred yards in diameter its widest part no crystal could be clearer than its waters its bottom which could be distinctly seen consisted altogether of pebbles brilliantly white its banks of the emerald grass already described rounded rather than sloped off into the clear heaven below and so clear was this heaven so perfectly at times that it reflects all objects above it that where the true bank ended and where the mimic one commenced it was a point of no little difficulty to determine the trout and some other varieties of fish with which this pond seemed to be almost inconveniently crowded had all the appearance of veritable flying fish it was almost impossible to believe that they were not absolutely suspended in the air a light birch canoe that lay placidly on the water was reflected in its minutest fibres with a fidelity unsurpassed by the most exquisitely polished mirror a small island fairly laughing with flowers in full bloom and affording little more space than just enough for a picturesque little building seemingly a fowl house arose from the lake not far from its northern shore to which it was connected by means of an inconceivably light-looking and yet very primitive bridge 
it was formed of a single broad and thick plank of the tulip wood this was forty feet long and spanned the interval between shore and shore with a slight but very perceptible arch preventing all oscillation from the southern extreme of the lake issued a continuation of the rivulet which after meandering for perhaps thirty yards finally passed through the depression already described in the middle of the southern declivity and in tumbling down a sheer precipice of a hundred feet made its devious and unnoticed way to the hudson the lake was deep at some points at thirty feet but the rivulet seldom exceeded three while its greatest width was about eight its bottom and banks were as those of the pond if a defect could have been attributed in point of picturesqueness it was that of excessive neatness the expanse of the green turf was relieved here and there by an occasional showy shrub such as the hydrangea or the common snowball or the aromatic syringa or more frequently by a clump of geraniums blossoming gorgeously in great varieties these latter grew in pots which were carefully buried in the soil so as to give the plants the appearance of being indigenous besides all this the lawn's velvet was exquisitely spotted with sheep a considerable flock of which roamed about the vale in company with three tamed deer and a vast number of brilliantly plumed ducks a very large mastiff seemed to be in vigilant attendance upon these animals each and all along the eastern and western cliffs where toward the upper portion of the amphitheatre the boundaries were more or less precipitous grew ivy in great profusion so that only here and there could even a glimpse of the naked rock be obtained the northern precipice in like manner was almost entirely clothed by grapevines of rare luxuriance some springing from the soil at the base of the cliff and others from ledges on its face the slight elevation which formed the lower boundary of this little domain was crowned by a neat stone wall of sufficient height to prevent the escape of the thea. Nothing of the fence kind was observable elsewhere, for nowhere else was an artificial enclosure needed. Any stray sheep, for example, which should attempt to make its way out of the vale by means of the ravine, would find its progress arrested after a few yards' advance by the precipitous ledge of rock over which tumbled the cascade that had arrested my attention as I first drew near the domain. In short, the only ingress or egress was through a gate occupying a rocky pass in the road, a few paces below the point at which I had stopped to reconnoitre the site. I have described the brook as meandering very irregularly through the whole of its course. Its two general directions, as I have said, were first from west to east and then from north to south at the turn the stream sweeping backward made an almost circular loop so as to form a peninsula which was very nearly an island and which included about the sixteenth of an acre on this peninsula stood a dwelling house and when i say that this house like the infernal terrace seen by vatek était d'une architecture inconnue dans les annales de la terre i mean merely that its tout ensemble struck me with the keenest sense of combined novelty and propriety in a word of poetry for than in the words just employed i could scarcely give of poetry in the abstract a more rigorous definition and i do not mean that merely outre was perceptible in any respect in fact nothing could well be more simple more utterly unpretending than this cottage its marvellous effect lay altogether in its artistic arrangement as a picture i could have fancied while i looked at it that some eminent landscape painter had built it with his brush the point of view from which i first saw the valley was not altogether although it was nearly the best point from which to survey the house i will therefore describe it as i afterwards saw it from a position on the stone wall at the southern extreme of the amphitheatre the main building was about twenty-four feet long and sixteen broad certainly not more its total height from the ground to the apex of the roof could not have exceeded eighteen feet 
To the west end of this structure was attached one about a third smaller in all its proportions, the line of its front standing back about two yards from that of the larger house, and the line of its roof, of course, being considerably depressed below that of the roof adjoining. At right angles to these buildings, and from the rear of the main one, not exactly in the middle, extended a third compartment, very small, being, in general, one-third less than the western wing. The roofs of the two larger were very steep, sweeping down from the ridge beam with a long concave curve, and extending at least four feet beyond the walls in front, so as to form the roofs of two piazzas. These latter roofs, of course, needed no support, but they had the air of needing it. Slight and perfectly plain pillars were inserted at the corners alone. The roof of the northern wing was merely an extension of a portion of the main roof. Between the chief building and western wing arose the very tall and rather slender square chimney of hard Dutch bricks, alternately black and red. The slight cornice of projecting bricks at the top. Over the gables the roof also projected very much, in the main building about four feet to the east and two to the west. The principal door was not exactly in the main division, being a little to the east, while the two windows were to the west. These latter did not extend to the floor, but were much longer and narrower than usual. They had single shutter-like doors. The panes were of lozenge form, but quite large. The door itself had its upper half of glass, also in lozenge panes, a movable shutter secured it at night. The door to the west wing was in its gable, and quite simple. A single window looked out to the south. There was no external door to the north wing, and it also only had one window to the east. The blank wall of the eastern gable was relieved by stairs, with a balustrade running diagonally across it, the ascent being from the south. Under cover of the widely projecting eave, these steps gave access to a door leading to the garret, or rather loft, for it was lighted only by a single window to the north, and seemed to have been intended as a storeroom. The piazzas of the main building and western wing had no floors, as is usual, but at the doors and at each window large, flat, irregular slabs of granite lay embedded in the delicious turf affording comfortable footing in all weather. Excellent paths of the same material, not nicely adapted, but with the velvety sod filling frequent intervals between the stones, led hither and thither from the house, to a crystal spring about five paces off to the road, or to one or two out, houses that lay to the north, beyond the brook, and were thoroughly concealed by a few locusts and cataplers. Not more than six steps from the main door of the cottage stood the dead trunk of a fantastic pear-tree, so clothed from head to foot in the gorgeous begonia blossoms that one required no little scrutiny to determine what matter of sweet thing it could be. From various arms of this tree hung cages of different kinds. In one, a large wicker cylinder with a ring at top revealed a mocking-bird. In another, an oriole. In a third, the impudent bobolink while three or four more delicate prisons were soundly vocal with canaries. The pillars of the piazza were enwreathed in jasmine and sweet honeysuckle, while from the angle formed by the main structure and its west wing, in front sprang a grapevine of unexampled luxuriance. Scorning all restraint, it had clambered first to the lower roof, then to the higher, and along the ridge of this latter it continued to writhe on, throwing out tendrils to the right and left, until at length it fairly attained around the east gable, and fell trailing over the stairs. The whole house, with its wings, was constructed of the old-fashioned Dutch shingles, broad and with unrounded corners. It is a peculiarity of this material to give houses built of it the appearance of being wider at the bottom than at the top, after the manner of Egyptian architecture, and in the present instance this exceedingly picturesque effect was aided by numerous pots of gorgeous flowers that almost encompassed the base of the buildings. 
The shingles were painted a dull grey, and the happiness with which this neutral tint melted into the vivid green of the tulip tree leaves that partially overshadowed the cottage can readily be conceived by an artist. From the position near the stone wall as described, the buildings were seen at great advantage, for the south-eastern angle was thrown forward, so that the eye took in at once the whole of the two fronts, with the picturesque eastern gable, and at the same time obtained just a sufficient glimpse of the northern wing, with parts of its pretty roof to the spring-house, and nearly half of a light bridge that spanned the brook in the near vicinity of the main buildings. I did not remain very long on the brow of the hill, although long enough to make a thorough survey of the scene at my feet. It was clear that I had wandered from the road to the village, and I had thus good traveller's excuse to open the gate before me, and inquire my way, at all events, so, without more ado, I proceeded. The road, after passing the gate, seemed to lie upon a natural ledge, sloping gradually down the face of the north-eastern cliffs. It led me on to the foot of the northern precipice, and thence over the bridge, round by the eastern gable to the front door. In this progress I took notice that no sight of the outhouses could be obtained. As I turned the corner of the gable, the mastiff bound towards me in stern silence, but with the eye and the whole air of a tiger. I held him out my hand, however, in a token of amnesty, and I never yet knew the dog who was proof against such an appeal to his courtesy. He not only shut his mouth and wagged his tail, but absolutely offered me his paw afterward, extending his civilities to Ponto. As no bell was discernible, I rapped with my stick against the door, which stood half open. Instantly a figure advanced the threshold, that of a young woman, about twenty-eight years of age, slender, or rather slight, and somewhat above the medium height. As she approached, with a certain modest decision of step altogether indescribable, I said to myself, "'Surely here I have found the perfection of natural, in contradistinction from artificial grace.' The second impression which she made on me, but by far the more vivid of the two, was that of enthusiasm. So intense an expression of romance, perhaps I should call it, or of unworldliness, as that which gleamed from her deep-set eyes, had never so sunk into my heart of hearts before. I know not how it is, but this peculiar expression of the eye, reading itself occasionally into the lips, is the most powerful, if not absolutely the sole spell which rivets my interest in woman. Romance, provided by my readers, fully comprehended what I would here imply by the word Romance and womanliness seem to me convertible terms, and, after all, what man truly loves in woman is simply her womanhood. The eyes of Annie, I heard someone from the interior call her, Annie darling, were spiritual grey. Her hair, a light chestnut. This is all I had time to observe of her. At her most courteous of invitations, I entered passing first into a tolerably wide vestibule. Having come mainly to observe, I took notice that to my right, as I stepped in, was a window, such as those in the front of the house, to the left a door leading into the principal room, while opposite me an open door enabled me to see a small apartment, just the size of the vestibule, arranged as a study, and having a large bow window looking out to the north. Passing into the parlour, I found myself with Mr. Landor, for this I afterwards found was his name. He was civil, even cordial in his manner, but just then I was more intent on observing the arrangements of the dwelling, which had so much interested me, than the personal appearance of the tenant. The north wing, I now saw, was a bedchamber. Its door opened into the parlour. West of this door was a single window, looking toward the brook. At the west end of the parlour were a fireplace, and a door leading into the west ring, probably a kitchen. Nothing could be more rigorously simple than the furniture of the parlour. 
On the floor was an ingrain carpet of excellent texture, a white ground spotted with small circular green figures. At the windows were curtains of snowy white jaconet muslin. They were tolerably full and hung decisively, perhaps rather formally, in sharp parallel plaits to the floor, just to the floor. The walls were prepared with a French paper of great delicacy, a silver ground with a faint green cord running zigzag throughout. Its expanse was relieved merely by three of Julian's exquisite lithographs a trois crayons, fastened to the wall without frames. One of these drawings was a scene of oriental luxury, or rather voluptuousness. Another was a carnival piece, spirited beyond compare. The third was a Greek female head, a face so divinely beautiful, and yet of an expression so provokingly indeterminate, never before arrested my attention. The more substantial furniture consisted of a round table, a few chairs including a large rocking chair, and a sofa, or rather settee. Its material was plain maple, painted in a creamy white, slightly interstriped with green, the seat of cane. The chairs and table were to match, but the forms of all had evidently been designed by the same brain which planned the grounds. It is impossible to conceive anything more graceful. On the table were a few books, a large square, crystal bottle of some novel perfume, a plain ground, glass astral, not solar lamp, with an Italian shade, and a large vase of resplendently blooming flowers. Flowers, indeed, of gorgeous colours and delicate odour, formed the sole mere decoration of the apartment. The fireplace was nearly filled with a vase of brilliant geranium. On a triangular shelf, in each angle of the room, stood also a similar vase, carried only as to its lovely contents. One or two smaller bouquets adorned the mantel, and late violets clustered about the open windows. It is not the purpose of this work to do more than give in detail a picture of Mr. Landor's residence, as I found it. How he made it what it was, and why, with some particulars of Mr. Landor himself, may, possibly, form the subject of another article. End of Landor's Cottage